Today's episode of Thin Air Podcast is brought to you by Wink. Wink is a direct-to-consumer wine company offering a wine club for a new generation of wine drinkers. If you want to directly support our podcast and get some delicious wine delivered straight to your door, head on over to trywink.com slash thin air. That's T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash thin air. Wink is offering our audience members who are 21 and over and live in the U.S. a $22 credit plus free shipping on their first order of four bottles of wine as a new member of Wink. So a big thank you to Wink for supporting Thin Air Podcast. Remember, for $22 off your first order, go to trywink.com slash thin air. That's trywink.com slash thin air to get $22 off when you become a new member. Thanks, Wink. Today's episode discusses at length the issue of suicide and concerns someone with suicidal thoughts and ideation. In the episode, family members consider various ways a suicide could have taken place. Please be advised if you are sensitive to this topic. If you or someone you know are considering suicide and need help, please don't suffer in silence. If you are in the U.S., you can call 1-800-273-8255, that's the suicide hotline, for confidential help and assistance, and someone will listen to you and try to help you. On the evening of July 11th, 2016, Dale Hope drove to his father Darwin's house in a northwest Boise, Idaho neighborhood. All he knew at that point was that his dad was in serious trouble and needed help. He lived alone, didn't have a lot of hobbies, didn't have any close friends. My brother Mike and I were the two closest to him. Pretty much an introvert, stayed home. Dale Hope, and I'm the youngest of his four sons. At the time, in the summer of 2016, Darwin was 92 years old. His sons were all grown, and he had lived on his own since his wife Margaret died in 1999. He was pretty sedentary. Overall health was good. He was a postman for over 35 years. He had walked around, so physically he was in pretty good shape. He did have a pacemaker installed oh, many years ago. He had regular doctor visits for his health. His hearing was really about the only thing that was really failing him in his later years. His mind was still clear. After my mom passed away, he was, um, I don't know if I'd call it depressed, but he just wasn't a real happy guy, lonely. Missed my mom terribly. Sons Dale and Mike tried to spend as much time with him as they could, both of them having busy lives. The three, Darwin, Dale, and Mike, would eat breakfast at their local favorite Greasy Spoon, the Capri restaurant in Boise. Every Saturday for the last, I don't know, 15 years, Mike would go down to Dad's house, pick him up Saturday morning. They'd come by my house, pick me up, and we'd have breakfast every Saturday morning. Pretty rare that the three of us didn't get together for breakfast. I I wish... I could have seen him more often than just every Saturday. Uh, I worked, you know, from 6.30 to to 5 each day, but seeing him every Saturday, I I felt really, really wasn't enough for a guy sitting at home alone, watching crappy TV or whatever. My name is Michael Hope. Mike is Darwin's third oldest son, and he was very close with his dad. Though Darwin was doing well physically, Mike saw firsthand his father's struggle with depression and suicidal thoughts, especially after Margaret died. To me, he was a very loving person. Like I say, he was my best friend. Mom passed away in 1999, and he wanted to commit suicide after her passing. My my thoughts to him were, People commit suicide, they go to the Sea of Lost Souls. So he refrained from that, and the next year he had his pacemaker put in, and he was, he was quite spunky, quite a new man. He was a trooper for 18 years, being without his wife and living alone. But the subject of suicide came up several times. On July 11th, 2016, Dale was making the drive to his dad's house because Mike who had been with Darwin earlier that day, was extremely concerned about his dad's state of mind. He had seen his father depressed and suicidal before, but this time, 
seemed different. I felt that it was not a good situation, that that would probably be the last time I saw him alive because of his severe, I mean, that's the most severe depression I've ever, ever seen him in. Darwin's depression was exacerbated by an excruciating condition in his groin called epididymitis. He was suffering from some uh, medical issues and was in some pain about three weeks leading up to that day. He had been in and out of emergency rooms. My brother Mike had taken him to emergency rooms a couple times to uh, try to get him some relief from some pain he was having. Darwin was a shy man, and his family often described him as not wanting to bother anyone. He had been in pain for weeks before involving his family, and he hid his suffering from them. He uh, mastered very well as far as uh, keeping it quiet. I know he was in extreme pain, but he didn't really show it. Darwin didn't like to take pain medication because of the side effects, so he was potentially suffering for weeks at this point with little relief. He didn't want to take a bunch of painkillers. He, he thought that the side effects of painkillers was, was more hassle than the pain relief. So he basically was, for three weeks, he was in agonizing pain and only taking like a Tylenol or something like that. He just really didn't like to take anything. After being in and out of the hospital and doctor's offices in extreme pain, a surgery was finally scheduled with the date set for July 14th, 2016. We had been to the doctor and we had scheduled a surgery for that Thursday of that week. So he had great hopes of, of getting that done. But July 11th, after Darwin and Mike arrived at Darwin's home from a doctor's visit, they got news that affected Darwin deeply, causing him to become despondent, hopeless. Then when the nurse had called shortly after we arrived at his home, and said that it couldn't be done, it was canceled until he got clearance from his cardiologist because he has a pacemaker, that he became extremely depressed, lost actually all hope that he could get the surgery done. After seeing his father's reaction to the news and his emotional state, Mike decided to call his brother Dale and asked him to come speak with their father in the hopes of raising his spirits. I wanted Dale to come over to uh, go over to see him. Dale's my partner. Dale's my, my, my closest brother. Dad listens to him. So I was, I was hoping that Dad would, would carry on and let us get this surgery scheduled. He would be in good physical health again, and he would be alive today. Dale arrived at his dad's house around 6 p.m. that night and stayed talking with him until 9 o'clock. This information was later reported to police, and these are the approximate times in the police report. After his arrival, Dale sat down to have a conversation with his father to try and understand and work through what Darwin was feeling. Darwin spoke about his wish to commit suicide. On that night, of course, I, I went to visit him and I said, hey, Mike's worried about you and we just I just wanted to stop by and see you and look on it as fast as we can to get you some relief. Throughout the two or three hours I was there, he brought up that he didn't want to live past 92 and a half, which would have been within the next month, I think he would have been 92 and a half. I'm not exactly sure what that date would have been. For the two or three weeks that he was in having this pain and leading up to that night that we were talking, that he had, all he had on his mind was different ways to commit suicide. I said, well, that, that, that doesn't make any sense. I wanted to change the subject, I guess. I said, well, you don't want to do that because if you did that, you're going to hurt Mike's feelings really bad because Mike was so close to him. And you don't want to do that because you just, you don't want to hurt Mike's feelings, do you? And he said, no. I said, besides that, you know, if we get you fixed up, you can get back to normal. And he goes, well, there's no point. Hindsight's 2020. I wish I would have had him explain to me a little bit more about the methods that he was thinking of. After speaking with Darwin for hours, Dale left feeling like everything was okay, that his dad would make it through and that they would get the surgery rescheduled, that everything would work out but he agreed that he could hold out for a couple more days until he could get his surgery and then everything would be back on track. 
speaking with Dale, it seems like he left and he was like, okay, we're going to get the surgery. Everything's going to be okay. And that your dad was on board with that. At least it seemed like that, that evening. Yeah. He's a good liar. Dad's a good liar. I guess. Like I said, he, he masked, masked this all, you know, all the pain, the whole bit. I, re, I was just hoping that he would listen to Dale. But the next day, July 12th, the family would learn that Darwin had different plans. Mike's wife, Elena, who works as a nurse, had tried to call Darwin around noon that day, but he didn't answer. So Mike, around 2.30 p.m., went to his dad's house to check on him. And when he got there, he discovered that Darwin and his car, a silver 2003 Pontiac Bonneville, were gone. I went through the house. He had left his wallet. He, he carried a couple of different, well, actually three wallets he would carry. One with his big money in it, one with his traveling money in it, one with his some small money, spending money, and his, his uh, credit cards. He'd left two wallets there. One was empty and one had a small amount of cash in it. And he'd left his cell phone and his hearing aids on his side table. After looking around the house, Mike decides to call Dale, and their first thought was if Darwin had even been gone long enough to be considered a missing person. Mike called me from my dad's house and said, hey, dad's gone, and that's when we were trying to decide, well, what do you do? I mean, did he drive over to Walmart? Well, I wonder where he went, or maybe we ought to just sit tight. Should we call the police? You know, we didn't really know what to do. We were in a quandary at that point. Do they have a time that they think he left? Do they think he left in the morning, or do they even really know? I last saw him at about 9, 9.15 that evening. It was still daylight Monday night, so I really doubt he would have left then. The, the bed looked like it had been slept in, and the pants that he was wearing that night, some uh, sweatpants, were beside the bed. So I'm pretty sure he spent the night at his house that night, so he must have left sometime between daybreak and one o'clock that day. But the status of the house is what made it more weird, you know, that he wasn't just Walmart because of the way he left the, left the house, things that were not normal for him. That female voice you heard there, that's Dale's wife, Lonnie. Many of the things Darwin left behind concern the family. He left behind cash, around three to four hundred dollars, which he had fanned out on top of the washing machine. He left behind his cane, which he needed to walk with his condition. He also left his hearing aids on the table next to his recliner, also his cell phone, and his cane was in the bedroom. There was no travel supplies taken. All of his, his bathroom uh, travel case was still at the house. From what we could determine, the only thing that was gone besides him was he had his glasses with him and his wallet with his driver's license and his debit card, and that was it. For him not to take his hearing aids was really unusual because he couldn't hear or communicate without them, so that was kind of an indication that something was really wrong. It was at the same point that Mike... Uh, called me at my office. We had discussed options, and uh, he agreed to go ahead and call the police department on a 911 call. And I said, well, you know, since we really aren't sure, maybe you should just call him and ask him, you know, what's the process for reporting a missing person? Are we jumping the gun here? Do they track down a 92-year-old guy after being gone for two hours? I mean, we didn't want to we didn't want to cause a big fuss over nothing, but then we also thought, well, this is unusual. We knew what his state of mind was, but physically we, we also figured he couldn't go very far because he couldn't walk and he couldn't sit, so driving would have been uncomfortable as well. So my brother Mike says, okay, I'll call into the police department and at least get a heads up and try to find out what the process is, and that's what he did. I called 911. I actually asked them, is there a time frame uh, where you can report somebody missing? Oh, no, no, no. I said, well, I want to report somebody missing. This call to 911 would start the investigation into the disappearance of Darwin Hope that has lasted ever since. In the year and just over two months since he vanished, 
The investigation would be led by false hopes and fruitless ideas of where Darwin could possibly have gone that day. Eventually, after nothing pans out, after Darwin and his car weren't found, in early 2017, both Dale and Mike were appalled to learn that Boise detectives had turned their suspicions to them and accused both of them of being directly involved in their dad's disappearance. I'm Jordan Sims, and welcome to episode 30 of Thin Air Podcast, The Disappearance of Darwin Lee Hope. Today's story is one from our hometown of Boise, Idaho, where I grew up and where we produced this podcast. There's something so different about writing a story that happened where you live. You know the streets, the places, you wonder how this could happen here. Boise is still a small town. Sometimes it feels like everyone knows each other. Both Dale and Lonnie knew my dad. Lonnie went to high school with him, and she knows my sister through a network of friends. That sort of thing happens a lot in Boise. So how is it possible that here, where it seems like everyone is a friend of a friend, could a 92-year-old man in agonizing pain vanish along with his car, never to be seen again? According to police reports obtained by Thin Air Podcast, two officers arrived at Darwin's house at 5.01 p.m. on July 12th, 2016. Though the names in the document are redacted, it's clearly Mike that's giving the story, which is what we've covered already. That Dale had been with Darwin the night before, that he left his cane and hearing aids, which was unusual, and that he thought his dad had left to commit suicide, probably by, quote, driving off a high bridge. The initial investigation began, and it was all fairly routine for a missing persons case. Within a short amount of time, I would say within an hour after Mike had made the call, Detective Iverson showed up with one of his partners to Dad's house, and they did a walkthrough around the house. And uh, within a day or two, there was uh, announcements on all the major TV channels in the Statesman say, hey, we got a missing elderly man, and here's a picture of the car. Uh, a lot of our family members had put stuff on Facebook, uh, but the police department started the investigation by verifying there was nothing suspicious at the house, and then they started the, uh, the public uh, notification that, hey, we've got a missing person, keep your eye out for this guy. And that was uh, the start of it. Um, I believe the detectives helped in notifying all the surrounding counties, including the police departments, the sheriff departments, or surrounding counties to be on the lookout for the car. Both brothers thought that wherever their father went, it couldn't have been far because of his limited mobility. Did you have any immediate thought of where he went? No, I did not. Uh, considering the pain he was in, I would think that he hadn't gone far. We started taking many steps to try to locate him. Mostly my sister-in-law, Elena, had a lot of um, contacts at the hospitals and doctor's offices. So she was notifying the security departments at major hospitals to locate, you know, if, if they saw the car in the parking lot. We're thinking maybe he might have driven to the hospital, done himself in the parking lot or something like that. The family also began to speculate on more secluded places their father could have gone that were relatively nearby. All the cities that Mike mentions here are around 30 minutes to an hour from Darwin's home in Boise. The only, only thing that I could think of and talking with my wife that he would go to maybe campgrounds or something like that or toward the Horseshoe Bend area or up to the Idaho City. We like, uh, we like traveling to the Idaho City area, Dad and I did. Darwin also used to take trips to Jackpot, Nevada by himself. Dale thought, at least initially, that this might have been a place that his father would have gone. He used to enjoy going to Jackpot three or four times a year and he would drive himself. And my brother Mike kind of put a stop to that, said, hey Dad, if you want to go to Jackpot, I'll take you. Yeah, and that's what makes it so unusual for us in this circumstance because he was predictable in the ways that he would spend his days when he was going to go to jackpot he'd say hey i'm going to take a ride to jackpot 
and he, he would call when he got back in town. So he would always stay real close with Mike and I and let us know what he was doing. Is Jackpot basically the only place he would venture out to? On his own, yes. Uh, other than local stuff, you know, he would travel to Walmart, Albertsons, which was close to his home. Uh, he would come up to our house for barbecues. But go home before dark. Yeah, he sure. always wanted to be home before dark because he, he couldn't see well at night, his night vision. Dale actually drove Boise to Jackpot and every possible side street or turnout or pullout that he felt like he should look into to no avail. Mike also spoke about how he and his parents loved to travel all across the U.S. together. When mom, when mom was alive, we, we traveled a lot. Every chance I got, you know, we'd do the coast. We traveled a lot. I, he showed me so many beautiful places. So I was their chauffeur. We would, we would go and go and go. <laughs> Yellowstone, we, I mean, I've got some great, great memories, I tell you. <laughs> so. Do you think, I mean, you guys like to travel. Do you think it's possible that he could have left Idaho? No. Considering the pain he was in, he couldn't sit in that seat more than 30 minutes would probably have been extremely painful for him. Police also thought it was likely that Darwin was close by and still within the state of Idaho. I spoke with Detective Monty Iverson at police headquarters here in Boise about this. Detective Iverson is the lead detective in Darwin's case. While he was only at liberty to speak generally about this case, because it is still an open and active investigation, he was able to offer some insight into what police believe happened to Darwin. Kind of from what they described about his physical state, it doesn't seem like he would have been able to go very far walking-wise, so... Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, same with missing person cases. Again, in general, you have to look at their age, their history. Some people don't want to be found. Some people just take off. They look at, you know, who this person is and what they're about, and then you yeah, have physical things. That's all things that we take into consideration in this case and all the other missing person cases. The vehicle is missing. That's a big part of it. So yeah. again, we thought if we could find the vehicle, then we could find Mr. Okay. Hope. So far, we have not been able to find either one. The car is a major aspect of Darwin's case, since it also remains missing. One of the scenarios are thoughts that he gone somewhere, parked, left the keys in the car, walked off somewhere, done it however he he was going to do it, and possibly that the car was uh, discovered by a bad guy or somebody and and, and it it was taken. How does it car disappear. You know, we've contacted all the tow companies and none of those companies can pick up a car without notifying the police department. If the VIN number shows up, if somebody's trying to register that car somewhere, anywhere in the United States, it would show up. Where is the car? That's the big question. But is it possible to strip a car of its VIN number? Like, let's say someone came across it. Could they get rid of that evidence? I mean, it's, it's possible to tear a car down and tear it all apart. Okay, sure it is. yeah, just from a, like, like, completely destroying the car. That's a possibility, sure. but very, you know, that's kind of an extreme of, of what if could happen. Right. A possibility could be, There's but there's a thousand possibilities. An early theory that Detective Iverson proposed was that Darwin could have driven his car into a number of local reservoirs, which would account for both Darwin and the car's disappearance. You hear about people driving into bodies of water and never being seen again. Does that happen? It does happen. Luckily, a lot of of the waterways here are reservoirs, and so they they lower or raise. So that a lot of times will answer our questions there once the water gets lowered. Unlike some parts of the state where it's lakes and that type of thing, they stay at a constant level most of the time. Near Boise, there are three major reservoirs that it is thought Darwin could have driven to. There's Lucky Peak in Arrow Rock, which the closest city would be Boise. And there's another reservoir called Black Canyon, which is outside of Emmett, Idaho. From his house, Lucky Peak was a 40 minute drive. Black Canyon was 51 minutes away and Arrow Rock was over an hour. Dale thinks that Black Canyon may have been a more likely place that Darwin would have gone. 
Before he went missing, Darwin had traveled around the area of Black Canyon with another son named Darwin Jr., who also lives in Boise. About a month before my dad disappeared, my older brother took him on a day trip. They went up through Horseshoe Bend and had breakfast and then drove up around Black Canyon Reservoir and just kind of spent the day together. It was a little unusual in the fact that those two really didn't get along that well. He wasn't as close to Darwin, which is his second oldest son, as he was to Mike and I. They had had their disagreements. They really never got along that well. But I uh, asked Dad after the fact, I said, well, how did your day go with, with Darwin? And he said, actually, it was pretty good. He had a pretty good visit with him, and Darwin was very uh, civil. And uh, the only complaint that Dad had about the day was the breakfast didn't taste very good. I kind of want to talk about, from your angle, the, the car going into the water. Do you think that that's a plausible theory? It is a plausible thing, and that's what the original thought was. And at that time, when he came up missing, the water levels were very high. Okay, right. Uh, of course, we then went into the fall and into the winter with all the water levels sure. lowering, right. hoping that we would have some success finding his vehicle, but never did. We checked a lot of different waterways, places that we'd heard that he'd like to go to or had been that were nearby, uh, places where water was lowering. As of this time, we still have not found Mr. Hope or his vehicle. Dale also points out that this reservoir could be a potential source of evidence because its water level does not drop unlike Lucky Peak and Arrow Rock, in the winter. Really, the last thing I can think of is he's got to be in Black Canyon. He's got to be underwater. That's, that's about as far as he could stand to drive. If he was somewhere between Boise and, and Black Canyon, he'd be in a public area where he could be found. One question I had for Detective Iverson was if it's possible to drive into a body of water and not leave any evidence behind. I think that kind of boggles my mind, the idea that someone could just speed up, drive into water, and there's there's nothing left behind. I wanted to know if that was accurate. Is it common that there's no evidence? Would there be skid marks or marks along the pathway or there can be depending on uh, where they go but there's some sure. cases where people just drive into boat ramps and that right. way and there isn't any type of skid depending if there's people there or not but then again a lot of times people travel that area a lot we see it there right. are spots depending where it is that yeah we see skid marks or marks in general look for all those i've contacted numerous agencies of where you know bodies of water are at but uh they have not seen any leads or anything suspicious or anything in their areas. Okay. And again, they, we've checked those waterways as well. One of the first questions we had was if sonar had ever been utilized at Black Canyon in the search for Darwin or his car. In a document we received through a public record request, there is one note likely from Detective Iverson from March of 2017 that reads, quote, I made contact with Sergeant Briggs of the Ada County Sheriff's Department. He is the supervisor of the Ada County Dive Team. Sergeant Briggs advised me that he took sonar up to the area where all the boat launches are to check for any vehicles. He stated he was unable to check every spot in Black Canyon, but was confident there were no vehicles near any of the boat launches. They only did a search of the loading ramps at Black Canyon Reservoir, and they only did that March of this year. So that was a little discouraging for us. Detective Iverson came up with the idea that if a car, usually based on his experience, if a car can't be found, it's underwater. And we kept asking him to, to you know, further look at the reservoirs, and, and they really hadn't done anything what we thought should have been a little more aggressive in searching that reservoir. Then we asked him, well, how come you're not searching Black Canyon? And uh, they did eventually send a volunteer firefighters for Emmett. They went and looked at two or three of the uh, boat ramps areas, but the reservoir to this day has not been searched in any kind of detail or effort. Are there plans for future sonar searches of any particular bodies of water? I think we'll take that all into consideration, what we see for water levels and all that, and all the main areas around here and all the places that the Hope family has discussed. We are in Idaho, so there's a lot of bodies of water. It makes it difficult when there's that many areas from rivers to lakes to ponds to whatever. Again, with Mr. Hope, from what uh, the family was telling us, they didn't think he would drive 
an extremely long ways. I think we've checked all the major areas within an hour or two drive uh, that we can think of. We have nothing to base off from besides where he was at that night being gone then from there. So we really don't have any direction to look or any area in particular. We have a 360 degree search pattern from his house. Of course, it is not known that Darwin chose to drive into any body of water at all. It's just speculation. Both Mike and Dale have a hard time believing that their dad would ruin his car anyway. And the idea of him being underwater puzzles us too because my dad wasn't a big water guy, he didn't fish, he uh, didn't swim, and he liked his car so much that we just really find it unusual that he'd want to destroy his car. He was really proud of his car. He always loved his cars, so I don't don't think he wanted to, uh, you know, submerge his car or destroy his car uh, or do anything inside of his car that would mess it all up. There was also the question of why Darwin left in the first place. Both brothers agreed that, considering his mental state the night before, that it was highly likely that he left to commit suicide. If Darwin chose to do this, why vanish, and why with his car? It leaves us with the bigger question of what his plan was, and why he chose to end his life this way. I have no idea whatsoever where he would drive to, or how he would do the deed. We thought maybe possibly he would would have taken his, some of his medications and things like that, or tried to overdose. But none of, his, none of his medications seemed to be missing. We checked some of the pawn shops and things to see if there was any gun purchased. We took his picture in and said, hey, did you see this man? You know, he's talked about using a gun, but I, I'm not sure that you have the courage to do that. But a person in there not in the right mind, who's to say? I, I, I can't say whether or not he would do it that way or not. And that's another thing that goes through my mind is how he did it. If, if he was going to do it, how did he do it? The family would look for answers in what Darwin left behind, which is always hard to know, right? Does it mean something or is it meaningless? One thing that stuck out to me was that before he left that day, he paid two utility bills. Well, we did look at his check checkbook and he had signed and sent out two checks. One was a power bill and the other thing got, I think it was insurance. Anyway, he paid two bills before he left and there was some confusion on the dates because he had July 13th, he, I think. Yeah, he post-dated uh, some payments, which, you know, sometimes with the elderly that's not uncommon, but... Yeah, so he paid two bills before he left, which we thought was really... But they were already gone. They were in the mailbox and Yeah, gone. and they weren't due until the following month. I feel like this happens with almost every story that we tell. Does this clue mean everything or does it mean nothing? Was his writing of these checks a sign of something final, a sign that he was intent on ending his life? Or is it just a normal everyday thing to do and he simply paid bills before leaving that day and then something happened to him once he left? Either way, these two bills are the last activity on Darwin's bank statements. Darwin's debit card, which they believed was with him, has never been used and has never been found. When we get back from the break, the arrival of 2017 prompts Detective Iverson to start from scratch in the case, which changes the focus from finding Darwin to accusing the brothers of helping their father disappear. The evidence and impact of that when we get back from this short break. Thanks to Wink for supporting our podcast. Wink is targeting a new generation of wine drinkers who want to do away with the pretense and simply enjoy reasonably priced, great wine. Wink custom tailors wines to the taste of each individual consumer and delivers three bottles of wine each month to your doorstep for $39 plus a flat $6 shipping rate. Once you visit Wink's website, you can take a 20-second palette profile quiz to get instant wine recommendations based on your unique profile. 
And right now, Wink is offering our audience members who are 21 and over and live in the U.S. a $22 credit plus free shipping on your first order of four bottles of wine as a new member of Wink. So to try it for yourself, go to trywink.com slash thin air and you'll get $22 off your first order of four bottles of wine when you sign up to become a new member. So again, thank you so much to Wink for supporting our podcast and we would love it if you tried it out for yourself. The time Darwin went missing, the middle of July, was a time that was emotionally significant to him. They met during World War II. My mom was a war bride out of England, and my dad uh, brought her home and was just, they got married in England, and then after the war, they came home. July 14th, 1946, was the day that Darwin's wife, Margaret, arrived in Boise from England. According to an interview that Dale gave police, he said, quote, Mom arrived at the Boise train depot and thought she'd arrived in heaven. Is that the day that your mom came to Boise? I mean, do you think that that was significant for, for your dad? It was, it was a significant date for him. Whether he planned it, that, I don't know. Darwin and Margaret had a rocky relationship at times, but both brothers commented that their parents loved each other a lot. They did have a, a drinking problem in the middle part of their marriage. They'd been married over 50 years, but they had stopped drinking. And uh, together, they traveled like to the Oregon coast. They went down to Jackpot. They were not real social people, but they were really close and inseparable. Uh, they were, yeah, they did everything together. Of course, the relationship improved. Uh, you know, when when they were both sober. They both quit at, at that point in 1982 when, when he retired. Mom kept things together. She was a good mom. I mean, she was a good wife and raised four boys, and they both worked very, very hard. How did Darwin's personality change after she died, or did his personality change after her death? She was all, always pretty quiet and introverted. I think he was remorseful and regretful that he hadn't been more uh, willing to fulfill her desires. You know, I think she would have liked to have been around the grandkids a little more, and my dad really didn't enjoy that. He was kind of uh, depressed that he didn't have her longer, for, obviously, but he also wished he'd probably uh, done more things that she wanted to do, because she was real social, and he would call her a gabber, because she always wanted to talk. That was just the opposite of my dad, but he really missed her, and... and uh, you know, really cared about her a lot. My mom's health started failing when she was in her mid-70s and she passed away when she was 76. They were just uh, really good parents. They both worked really hard, you know, gave us a pretty good life. After Darwin's disappearance, summer gave way to fall and winter. And after considering some of the nearby secluded campgrounds and bodies of water and finding nothing, Detectives hoped that something would be found deeper in the woods, that a hunter would stumble on the car and Darwin would be nearby, but this didn't happen. It was still high gear season for camping, biking, hiking. We, if anybody was in the foothills, there would be some activity. And also there was a, a lot of fires around southern Idaho. Also, we were thinking, well... If he's in a forest area where there might be a fire, we thought, well, at least the uh, firefighters would find him that way. And after several months and it started to turn to fall, several conversations with Detective Iverson were thinking, well, if he's parked in the forest somewhere, then uh, surely the hunters will find him during hunting season. And that never happened either. So once we got through the Christmas holidays and nothing was found by the hunting season, I think the frustration level had ratcheted up a little bit. We're all kind of thinking, well, my goodness, we still haven't found him. And so Detective Iverson contacted Mike and said, uh, you know, his boss wanted him to start from square one. And the typical approach is to look at those closest to the victim, if, if you want to call that a victim. And that was uh, Mike and I. 
In January of 2017, Detective Iverson asked the three brothers, Dale, Mike, and older brother Darwin Jr., to all take lie detector tests. Iverson asked if both Mike and myself would submit to a lie detector test, and he had also reached out and contacted Darwin Jr. Mike and I agreed to do it, and Darwin Jr. declined. So we, we took our tests, uh, I believe it was late January, gave him as much information as we could. It was a pretty uh, regimented lie detector test. Did you have anything to do with your dad's disappearance? Do you know where he's at now? Do, do you know if anybody else brought harm to him? Uh, there were just a lot of questions like that, you know, determined if either myself or, or Mike had anything to do with his disappearance. I asked Dale if he thought it was odd or suspicious that Darwin Jr. refused to take the lie detector test. You mentioned your brother, Darwin Jr. Do you think that investigators are suspicious of him? Have they said anything to you about that? You know, they haven't conveyed any suspicion. When I asked Iverson if he made a time to do a, a lie detector test with my brother, Darwin, that was at the time he was doing ours, he goes, well, at this point, your brother and I are negotiating. Well, I found out later, because I don't really talk to my older brother, Darwin, either that much, that he had told Iverson just, he wasn't going to do that and that Iverson needed to do his job, so um, never did it. Do you think he would have had anything to do with this? No. You know, not that they were good friends, but they were not enemies either. He wouldn't have done that. We've never talked about it. It's not been an issue on the table, and as much as some of us don't care for our older brother, I just don't think that's, I don't think that's in the wheelhouse. From the documents that we received, it doesn't seem like police are investigating Darwin Jr. as far as his involvement or role in his father's disappearance. There's little information about him. Some of the results of the lie detector test that Mike and Dale took are available in the documents that we requested. The conclusion for Dale's polygraph was inconclusive. Mike's results were deception indicated. Three questions are noted as relevant to this finding, and those are largely the same question, only worded differently, and that is, were you involved in the disappearance of that man? Was it stressful for you to take the, the lie detector test? I'd have to say it is, you know, it's almost like I know that Mike didn't do anything to my dad, I didn't do anything to my dad, but when you're in those testing rooms, it's really weird, and how you respond and the tone of your voice and and your demeanor, I guess, is all measured. So with that in mind, I'm trying to answer without acting like I'm guilty of something I didn't do, you know, and you know where your dad's at? No. It was a, it was a unique and uncomfortable situation for sure. I was more than willing if, if this was where the investigation was going. I got no problem with that. I, I've got nothing to hide, so that didn't seem odd to me at all. The thing that seemed odd to me is when they told me that we failed it. I said, no way, that's just stupid. But what shifted is when they started pointing fingers at me. That hurt. It hurt a lot. Detective Iverson asked if Mike and I would come in for an update, I guess, what we were looking for, or where do we go from here kind of meeting. And when we got there, we were met by Detective Iverson and one of his partners, if you will. I, I was taken into a examination room by his partner, and Detective Iverson took Mike into a separate room. And the, the crux of their, that day, which was a total surprise to us, was that we had both gave deceptive answers in our lie detector test, and that they were each, unbeknownst to us, because we were in separate rooms at the time, but they were, each of these detectives were trying to get each of us to confess or tell that the other person had something to do with my dad's disappearance, and we both just were getting quite agitated. I hope they videoed it, because I told that both of them, because Iverson came in to see me after the fact, and they were saying things like, uh, we were deceptive in our answers, that they, their theory, their new theory was that Mike and I had sympathy for my dad and that we assisted him in suicide. One of Detective Iverson's theories was that Dale, who owns a local recycling plant called Diamond Street Recycling, had, potentially with his brother Mike, helped his dad kill himself and then disposed of his body and car in their recycling pit. 
it was a theory that detectives had obviously spent some time concocting. Their theory went on to say that because uh, I'm one of the largest landowners in our family, we have a recycling center up by the airport, 32 acres, they were trying to get me to confess that I had buried my dad and his car in our pit. And he said, you better come clean now because if I get the prosecutor involved, we're going to get search warrants. And I said, you call the prosecutor right now and you don't need a search warrant. You can follow me up there and you can look around all you want. And of course, I was getting more and more irritated. And I found out after the fact that my brother Mike, they're trying to get him to say that I did it. And they're trying to get me to say Mike did it. And that we somehow coerced and disposed of the body in the car. Did he give you any explicit reason or evidence that he had about your father's car and your father being at your facility? No, that's just a theory because I own a demolition company, have a lot of big equipment. So when he had Mike in Mike in, in the room, he was trying to get Mike to tell him all about this equipment that I have and this 32-acre site. You know, it's a big open pit and we're filling it up. And, uh, you know, that was, that was their theory since I'm the the guy with the most land in the family, that that's where the car is. Okay, so yeah, no no evidence, it's just a speculation, basically. Well, they had done, they had done background checks on the, on the family, we're assuming, for them to, you know, to find out that, because that was something that wasn't even, uh, wasn't a question like, oh, do you have a big pit, you know? So they obviously had done research. We had a very, very devastating fire in August of last year here at, Diamond Street Recycling that was spontaneous combustion, and it was very horrific. Much of that smoke from a Boise fire that's been burning for more than 24 hours. The Diamond Street fire broke out yesterday afternoon at a recycling center near the Boise airport. This fire broke out at Diamond Street Recycling on August 28, 2016. Though it was contained by the next day, small smoldering fires continued for days. Smoke from the fire covered Boise, and 45 firefighters were on the scene. Early on, the damages to their business were estimated at over $100,000. It was an absolutely devastating fire. But Detective Iverson's new theory was that the fire, which Lonnie says was caused by spontaneous combustion, was actually set to intentionally destroy the evidence of Darwin's car and his body. And so they did bring that up that, um, you know, was that fire something that was started to do a cover-up, basically. And that, that on, in itself, to me, is just absurd. Police also claimed that Mike's 911 call was strange, bizarre even. Both Mike and Dale stressed that when they called, they didn't even know if they could report him missing at that point, and that they had never done anything like that before. The detective said that the 911 call from my brother Mike was one of the strangest calls that you've ever heard. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, he started the call with, I have a few questions about missing persons. And I said, well, that's exactly what we discussed before he called you, that we, we didn't know how the system or how it worked. I asked Detective Iverson about this 911 call to see if I could listen to it or if a Freedom of Information Act request would be denied because it was part of their investigation. I had a question about the 911 call. Can I, is that a part of the investigation? Mm -hmm. Okay, it is. so if I were to do like Freedom of Information, that would be, is part of your investigation, right? It is part of the investigation, okay. yep. After talking with Iverson, because I want to get that 911 call, so. I asked him if it was a part of the investigation, and I think he's brought it up to you and Dale as, like, the 911 call. Do you feel like it's, I mean, I don't know. I feel like it's so bizarre that they would use that uh, against you in any way. Do you, how do you feel about that? I don't feel it was unusual. They they seem to think it was kind of the craziest uh, 911 call they've ever heard. It's like, whatever, whatever. Yeah, how are you supposed to sound when you call 911? I guess I don't know the answer to that. These accusations made for some discord between police and the Hope brothers. Dale hired an attorney shortly after. Once this happened, the relationship between the Hope brothers and police went from lukewarm to ice cold. All through this process, we were answering his phone calls, we were visiting when he wanted, 
We let them come into the house whenever they wanted. Uh, we were giving them as much information as possible. Then all of a sudden, they just turned their gun on us. When Dale said we're the prime suspects, I couldn't believe it. I said, that is unbelievable. That's absurd. Nobody could believe it. As far as the detectives go, they don't know anything outside of their office. I don't think he got out of his chair to even go out and follow a lead or an angle when we thought that possibly he was in, in the Black Canyon. Oh, well, he, you know, he'd call a couple of weeks later and say, well, Boise Fire and Rescue are going to go up and do some exercises up there, and they, they're going to look up there. And it's like, well, great. I don't know why they didn't do it months before. Everything, everything costs money, so I don't know if they were asking, you know, wanting us to pay for it, which we would gladly have done. The next move investigators make is in May of 2017, Dale, who is the executor of his dad's estate, was left in charge of his house, which had sat empty since Darwin disappeared. After we hired the attorney, we no longer had direct contact with Arverson. Anything had to go through our attorney. It was pretty quiet for quite a while, and then they put a request in through our attorney to uh, come look at the house one more time. And throughout this whole period of time, uh, I had been uh, court appointed as a conservator of the estate. And so we left Dad's house pretty much as as is. Uh, I'd mentioned to our attorney that, you know, we're getting on to close to a year anniversary by this time. And I thought, well, as a conservative, we'll probably look at maybe renting Dad's house out. So Iverson, uh, Detective Iverson said, well, he wanted to bring over two criminalists, forensic people, or whatever that meant to us. We didn't really know what that meant, but they wanted to go through the house again. Two ladies with their briefcases and their rubber gloves and their blue lights and all that. I think they were looking for stains or anything unusual. Can you talk about the criminologists that came to the house and anything that they found that was relevant? We had a, uh, our crime lab respond to the house just to begin, just kind of detail everything because he's been gone so long. We wanted to just look at everything. I can't give you any detail, but when somebody comes up missing for that long of a crime period, then we go back to the original spot of where they were last seen, making sure that we've covered all our bases. Police documents detail this search of the house, which took place on May 23rd of this year. The criminalists were looking for, quote, large areas of blood and or cleanup of blood, end quote. The house was found largely to be clean and no visible stains were noted on the carpet of any room in the house. No areas fluoresced or darkened when using what's known as an alternative light source or a black light when looking for biological evidence. Detective Iverson wouldn't speak with me about this side of the investigation, and he wouldn't say if this is a criminal case or not. Can I ask if it's a criminal investigation against them yet, or can you answer that question? Uh, Again, I can't give any specifics on the case. When in the missing person case itself, we talk to everybody, neighbors, family, friends. Our main goal in this case is to find Darwin Holt. He is the victim that we are looking for, especially with somebody who's been missing over a year at 92 years of age and with his vehicle missing. A lot of questions for a lot of different people. Our unit has several missing persons where people have been vanished for years. And we treat missing persons cases over that long period of time just like we would one some people don't want to be found they just want to go away from whatever they got going in life some people are suicidal some people then we don't know maybe there was some type of foul play that's the problem with the missing persons cases you never know on that and every angle needs to be looked at exactly i thought about this theory a lot and i tried to see it from the perspective of police In the police reports that we got, there's this mind map that detectives used to build their questions for Mike and Dale. And they basically list all of the possibilities of how the brothers could have been involved with Darwin's disappearance. It's a really unique insight into what detectives are thinking. The different possibilities that are listed are to hurt, to cause the disappearance, to plan, to dispose of evidence, that you know where he or his car is, to kill, to dispose of body, or to help. Dale stated that detectives didn't accuse either brother of murder, but instead suggested that they helped their father kill himself and then disposed of his body. This was immensely frustrating and hurtful for both brothers. 
because they didn't do their job and they needed to close out the case and they thought, well, here's the two guys closest to him. And they, they said, well, we don't believe you guys have a black heart. We just think that you assisted your dad. Like, no, we proved up to the day he disappeared that we were trying to prevent that from happening. In trying to understand the foul play perspective, I try to understand why Mike or Dale would have chosen to do it this way. What reason would they have had to dispose of him in the way that police suggest to not only help him die, but then to get rid of his body and his car? The first idea was that they wanted money, but Dale dismissed that. And my dad's estate is pretty modest. Uh, it's not anything that any one of the three of us that are going to be recipients of his estate would do to harm him. It's not enough money to, to do any harm to any. He's very modest. Police also asked for Darwin's financial records, and Dale looked through them too to see if he could find anything suspicious. Once I got my conservatorship, I was able to get seven years. The bank had seven years of records on my dad's account. So I'd looked through most of those. So I had them all on my desk. I think it was just about three weeks ago. Uh, the request came through our attorney to give uh, Detective Iverson the six months worth of financial documents leading up to his disappearance. So I gave him January through the end of July uh, of 16 uh, copies of the records, which there's nothing there. I've already reviewed it because I was looking for the same thing. Was somebody taking advantage of him? Was he sending money to Jamaica? You know, what the hell's going on? But uh, his accounts were pretty much pristine and in order and very well documented and nothing out of the ordinary. Dale also asserted that no one in his family needed the money, but let's just pretend for the sake of it that they did. If they did need to make Darwin disappear for any nefarious reason, why would you do it like this? I couldn't help but think that if they did want him dead for money, which I, I don't think that they did, but if this was their motive, making him go missing was a bad idea. Because of his disappearance, Darwin can't be declared legally dead for five years. Also, no relevant evidence was found at the house after being searched by criminalists. No blood, no real physical evidence of any kind was found. As Dale said, Detective Iverson tried to get the brothers to talk by claiming that he didn't believe that what they did was out of malice, but was rather to help Darwin to end his life as a kindness to him. If this was the case, couldn't they just have helped him at home? Why go to all the trouble of hiding their father's body and car, something which was unnecessary if they were only helping him to die? If you believe they were doing this for more nefarious reasons, then hiding the car and his body sort of makes sense. They would be destroying evidence, throwing detectives off the trail. But this doesn't seem to be the approach that investigators are taking. If one or both of the brothers were helping him to end his life, there's no reason for the cover-up, no reason for his car or body to be gone. Dale also stressed that there was a plan for his remains that was really important to him. And the thing is, Jordan, is he um, has had specific instructions of what to do upon his passing. Well, yeah, so when my mom died, she was cremated, and my dad had her ashes, and since he's disappeared, I, I now have them in our, I have my mom's ashes in our house. And, and for the longest time, as the executor of the will, my responsibility is to have dad cremated, mix their ashes together, and spread them at a special place in Boise on the anniversary of my mom's arrival uh, from England. I'm supposed to mix their ashes and and spread them together, but if I can't find his body, there won't be any ashes. So that's another quandary. It's like, well, Dad, why did you put me in this situation? So you think that he, if he committed suicide, that he would make it easy for me to find him so I could follow his wishes. In one of the interviews before the lie detector test that was given to Dale, Detective Iverson asks him this question, and Dale replies, quote, I have had discussions with people in our family that it would have been nice if he had insisted on a kind of Kevorkian thing, if that's what he really wanted. And I would love to be there with him and to give him a kiss on the forehead and hold his hand. I, 
I think this now has switched to Detective Iverson, confirmed with Dale that he in no way helped his dad to kill himself or anyone else to cause his disappearance. Did you and your brother have anything to do with your father's disappearance? No, and I think one of the things that kind of sticks in my mind is both of us during the early stages of talking to Iverson were, you know, obviously emotional and sad. And one of the things that both Mike and I express is, you know, if he was going to do this and if we knew he was going to do this, we would have really wanted to be there with him to want to share his his that's with him, you know, if that's what he really wanted to do, I think Mike and I would have definitely been the two people that he would have wanted with him. And for the thought of us thinking of him dying alone is the hardest thing. And we, we verbalized that to everybody, our friends, our family, the detectives, even my attorney. I said, you know, that's the hardest thing is to think of him being in pain, 92 years old, and dying alone. But that just hurts us tremendously. Both brothers don't really know where the case stands now, since the focus has shifted to them. You know, I don't want to shed a, a bad light on the police department, but we are frustrated with Iverson. Basically, he didn't do much throughout the fall, hoping that the car would have been found and the case closed. And then when the car wasn't found, how he took it a about face and really, I guess maybe it's a good cop, bad cop that we, Mike and I both felt comfortable talking to him and giving a, you know, our heartfelt opinions and concerns and then to uh, wholeheartedly agree to a lie detector test and then to have him just turn on us like some kind of rabid dog, it was kind of weird. But it's not, he's in tech, in tech the whole force because we definitely respect the police department. Yes. We don't want it to sh- add light on them. You know, I'm not very impressed with him. I was very, very impressed with uh, patrol officers. They were very kind and uh, uh, suggested. So as far as them doing investigations, I'm I'm not impressed. They're, they're very desk-oriented. So what exactly has Iverson done in this case? Of course, he couldn't or wouldn't tell me much. Some of the public records that we have detail what he has done. They pulled Carfax records for a history of Darwin's car. They checked his financial records, as we already know. Nothing was found. They pulled video surveillance tape from a local Walmart that he shopped at from the day that Darwin disappeared. Nothing was found. He spoke with everyone connected to the case, including his doctor. He drove to Dale's recycling plant and was informed that they do not take cars or metal. He pulled pharmacy records. He followed up on some sightings, none of which panned out. He later knocked on doors and spoke to neighbors. And his conclusion as of July 2017 was, quote, at this time, I have no further leads. Do you think it's likely that he is still alive? I I always have hope, of course, being 92 years of age and being gone over a year. It gives me a lot of concern compared to a 25-year-old. We're still working in the case that he could still possibly be alive. We just don't have a lot of leads at the moment because it's just such a different case of a 92-year-old man missing, I guess 93 now, and his vehicle missing. Do you think that he'll ever be found? At this point, no, because remains are difficult to find. Yeah, you know, at the time that he uh, disappeared, the mountains were full of campers, uh, lots of travelers. I, I feel that he wouldn't go too far off uh, main highways. You know, if he found a dirt road of some kind, if he made it up into the mountains, mountain people are very, very observant. If they saw something like that, they would investigate it and report it. You know, a car sitting on the side of the road, it would be odd to them. And then as it pro- uh, progressed into October, any area within a 30-mile radius of Boise is overrun with hunters. And at that time, and that's another thing, Iverson was hoping that somebody would spot the car, spot the car, you know. We did have my daughter and a good friend of hers who's a helicopter pilot, they rented, we rented a helicopter and they went up to investigate uh, over the Black Canyon area. Uh, they were up for about an hour, hour and a half. 
uh, flying over uh, those different areas to see if they could spot the car. Uh, that that's a big thing is that Iverson was always uh, we got to find that car. We got to find that car. Well, that that is our only hope. But uh, from the era, it would be a speck. It would be, even from the era, it would be difficult to spot it. Before I end here today, I want to stress that Lonnie, Dale's wife, brought this story to me. I didn't go out chasing him down or looking for any specific angle. I think she brought it to me because it's this sort of pervasive mystery in their life. And I can't help but think that if they were involved in any way, why would they want to talk to me and share this story? That seems like the last thing they would want to do, that they would want this to go away. And maybe that's naive of me, but to me it really seems like they want this mystery solved. They want answers, and they deserve those answers. Well, we've, we've all talked so many times about we think that he wanted to go away, but he did not want to disappear. You know, we think he wanted to be, do what he wanted to do, but not, not be found. You know, he would want to be found because he just wouldn't want to do this to the boys. Darwin Hope was 92 years old when he went missing on July 12th, 2016. His car is also missing. It's a silver 2003 Pontiac Bonneville with the license plate 1A7478F. Darwin is 5'10", and he has white hair and blue eyes. He wears glasses, which are believed to be with him. Darwin was suicidal and may have gone missing for that reason. It is thought that he could not have traveled very far because of a medical condition. He wears hearing aids, but was not wearing them, so communicating with him would have been difficult. His family thinks it's possible, but not very likely, that he might have traveled to Jackpot, Nevada. Please be on the lookout for any car that seems strange or out of place, especially on Idaho roads, campsites, or waterways. If you don't remember the license plate number, we will have it up on our website at thinairpodcast.com, along with pictures and more information. If you have any information to provide, please contact Ada County Dispatch or Crime Stoppers. That information is also on our website. You can also email us confidentially at thinairpodcast at gmail.com, and we will send your information along. You know, and I pointed out to Iverson later that my brother Mike had done everything in his power uh, three weeks leading up to it. As soon as Mike knew that Dad was having problems, he was right on it, took care of it. You know, of course, my meeting with him that Monday night was to discourage him from doing anything stupid. Um, you know, I basically poo-pooed the idea of... Uh, suicide said come on dad we're gonna get you feeling better within a couple days you'll be back to your old self and he just didn't want that thin air podcast is produced by myself and daniel calderon with production assistance from nate halda music today was provided by blue dot sessions you can check them out at sessions.blue Additional music provided by Chris Sabrisky. You can check him out at chrissabrisky.com. Certain donors through our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash thinairpodcast, get rewards for supporting our independently created podcast. One of those rewards is to be credited as an executive producer of our show. The executive producers of Thin Air Podcast are Nicole Canterbury, Jack and Christy Lupian, Drusilla Dents, Rebecca Hardberger, Aaron Moore, Elle McManus, Heather Cadu, Mistea Pena, Bonnie Mortensen, Anthony Loper, and Elizabeth Farmer. Producing our podcast is a lot of work, and it's easy to sometimes feel kind of in a bubble. But knowing that there are people out there who support what we do, it really keeps us going and inspires us to be the best that we can be and to try to make this podcast everything that we know that it can be. So a really big thank you to all of our supporters, our executive producers, everyone who helps us out on Patreon. It means so much to us. I don't think we could ever say thank you enough. <laughs>